Welcome everyone to the Strategic Dialogue Concordia Action Alliance Vaccine Coordination, Production and Distribution. This strategic dialogue will be taking place in English, so if you prefer Spanish, please pop on over to the Spanish translation opportunity so that you can follow along in your preferred tongue. I'd like to take a moment to thank our esteemed panel. I appreciate the diversity of representation, both from country and across the region, as well as the stakeholder vantage point that we've brought together to talk about this particular subject. It's my real pleasure to introduce the panel. Their biographies are available on the SpotMe platform and you can dig deeper into the experience and credibility that they're bringing into today's conversation. But um, just to kind of guide you around my circle of Zoom over here, we have the Honorable Martha Delgado. She's the Vice Minister for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights for Mexico. We have Dr. Hazel Laws, Chief Medical Officer of St. Kitts and Nevis. Dr. Herman Escobar, Chief of Staff for the Ministry of Health and Social Protection in Colombia. Mario Simuli, Deputy Executive Secretary of Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, or ECLAC. Uh, we have Rashad Massoud, he's the Senior Vice President and Chief Program Officer for AmeriCares. Ben Hubbard, the CEO of Parcel, and Richard Meredith, Deputy Chairman for Digitalis. So it's a range of perspectives, sectors, countries, and preferred languages, but today we're really all gonna come together around a common challenge. Um, I'll acknowledge we're still in the middle of a global crisis, um, and I wanna recognize those that have lost loved ones or economic livelihoods due to this, um, this very challenging time, and our hearts go out, and um, we, we you know, really hope here at Concordia that you are able um, to find a better tomorrow um, but as we remain in the midst of this crisis, I do want to look optimistically to 2021 and the future of uh, vaccine development, delivery, and distribution. And so we'll keep today's conversation to that topic, although we could just as easily discuss testing, therapeutic access, or economic relief measures. Um, today should be fun. Strategic dialogues are intended to be interactive and engaging. And so I'm looking forward to my panelists speaking with each other um, and actively involved. And as there are questions, um, please feel free to um, send them over the newsfeed function um, for our audience, because we definitely want to make sure that we're engaging. And then um, I would just love to, to kick us off. Um, so we're going to begin with the goal of what Concordia hopes to accomplish today, which links back to the Concordia Action Alliance. The Action Alliance was launched this year to support discussion and debate, but most importantly, coordination as it pertains to natural disaster and global health response efforts around the world. It's associated with a fund that Action Alliance members, like AmeriCares and, and Rich, uh, Rashad here can attest to, um, a fund that members can access to catalyze their partnerships. And uh, throughout the years since it's been launched, we've held or co-hosted a number of discussions on how to enhance collaboration and partnerships for COVID-19. And today's part of that series. Um, and so if you're interested in more, you're welcome to um, pop over to Concordia's past programming and dive deeper into this subject. At this time, I'd like to turn to Her Excellency, Vice Minister Delgado, to provide a country perspective that grounds today's discussion. Um, after contextualizing this with a brief summary from Mexico's vantage point, we'll open to a full discussion with questions for the group. And as I mentioned earlier, from time to time, I'll be calling on you specifically, but broadly, we're just gonna have some fun with today's very important, very timely conversation. Vice Minister, please. Thank you, Han, and distinguished panelists, guests, friends, colleagues uh, present in this important event. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, this is a very extremely important conversation on the single most relevant challenge we have faced this year and probably uh, of at least the decade to provide a safe and efficient alternative to protect the most vulnerable population from COVID-19 pandemic. It is a great challenge. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank uh, everyone at Concordia Americas, including our moderator, for the kind invitation uh, to open this amazing panel, uh, and also for setting up this summit, which is right uh, uh, in the right time. Your exemplary work has significantly contributed to, the, to help my country together with a myriad of stakeholders to develop lasting partnerships that helps us to face the most pressing developing issues. So allow me to start by saying that the vaccine is currently the main way uh, that we can use or will be able to stop uh, and recover from the devastating COVID-19 pandemic. Certainly it's not uh, the only one, 
non-medical sanitary measures such as quarantine and face masks are the most uh, cost and time effective and efficient ways to fight the disease. However, as we have seen in the last couple of months, these measures uh, have a profound disruptive consequence in our economic, social, uh, and uh, or the current way that we are facing this uh, uh, pandemic has been challenged by these changes of uh, habits in the population. So um, the, uh, the, this uh, pandemic, which is disproportionately affecting the most vulnerable populations, uh, such as women or the elderly or poor people, uh, uh, is important to, to be addressed by different uh, strategies. So while medical treatments are also a cornerstone to minimize the impact of COVID-19, these still remain difficult to access due to the final, um, uh, the financial um, availability or, or different reasons. So uh, all the countries are searching for different uh, measures to face the pandemic, and one of them is the access to a candidate vaccine, which indeed right now is uh, uh, about to appear in the world. Um, in this regard, and uh, knowing that the, the terrible virus has taken precious lives, 1.5 million people worldwide, and put more than 64 million of persons at risk we cannot afford not to support the development of vaccines. So unfortunately, uh, one of the biggest challenges we have faced has been the pandemic of misinformation too. Even today, one of the most frequent questions we get on, on uh, the matter of vaccines is why should we get it instead of how do we get it? And uh, in this regard, for example, in my country today appear uh, a, um, uh, a poll showing that 10% of Mexican population are not willing to, vac to be vaccinated. So this shows the also skepticism around the vaccination process, not just for COVID-19, but uh, for other also for other uh, uh, illnesses or viruses. Um, let me very very let me be clear on the on this on the sense that despite the uh, many challenges that the vaccines uh, development have as uh, any technology it is uh, the best economic and medical solution to protect the most vulnerable people and to slowly but surely recover uh, our pathway towards a sustainable development so pretty much like climate change we have to listen uh, to science and uh, act promptly as we cannot allow fake news or to affect uh, the people that now are, uh, are suffering by these circumstances. There are many topics we could talk about uh, regarding the pandemic. However, uh, for the sake of time and the uh, theme of the panel, I will focus on the efforts uh, of Mexico. Um, First of all, we had to understand that we were acting under a great level of uncertainty. We have a, um, a, a, an environment of uncertainty since six months ago, we starting to search for vaccines uh, for Mexico. Virtually, uh, this is impossible to think of securing the amount of vaccines to, to the country uh, in the, uh, the global manner very, very, very uh, fast. But uh, one of the biggest challenges we face as a region in Latin America in general is the lack of capacities for the development for production and distribution of vaccines, uh, also medical equipment and medicines. So the vast majority of these products need to be exported. And uh, in Mexico, we have undertaken a diplomatic approach of this challenge. In this context, we decided not to bet uh, just on uh, bilateral agreements, but support multilateral strategy in the first place. Um, now Mexico uh, is proudly placed as one of the leading nations that has reserve of vaccines for, for little above 90% uh, of our population uh, in uh, very different ways. Uh, multilateral efforts Mexico has championed at both the international and regional level, level on the promotion and adoption of initiatives that secure an equal access to medical supplies, including vaccines. 
together with 170 co-sponsors, uh, member states of the UN uh, General Assembly, Mexico led efforts to approve a resolution to warranty the access of medical supplies in equal circumstances, including vaccines. Moreover, we have uh, advocated for this approach in the G20. And additionally, Mexico was the first Latin American country to join the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. Indeed, we are the only one Latin American country right now at CEPI. Uh, as we strongly believe in their mission to develop and uh, offer vaccines technology that is open for all. As well, uh, we have joined the COVAX mechanism uh, related to this last point. We are proud also to be part uh, of the COVAX facility as a, a paramount multilateral effort, not only to warranty vaccines for 20% of the population of each country which is partnering in this idea, but also showing that it's possible to have solutions sharing the risks and responsibilities. Uh, and this is a very strong precedent in this sense. Uh, on the bilateral efforts, we have followed uh, two main pathways. First, the direct commercial negotiation with uh, three different uh, companies. Uh, right now, established communication after 20 approaches, we, we down uh, the, the uh, agreements with AstraZeneca, with Pfizer and with CanSino, a Chinese one. And also be, being part of the, uh, of the COVAX facility uh, is a, a, a way to approach the, the possibility to, uh, to, to have the vaccines from December to uh, April of 2001. Uh, in closing, I would like to restate the great importance of partnerships to have an effective and efficient vaccination strategy. I think that we can talk about more how we can manage on bilateral agreements and also multilateral efforts to support not just uh, uh, our own countries, but also to uh, help other countries of low income countries, for example, which are going to also be paramount to fight against the pandemic. No one is going to be safe after all uh, can be safe. And this is a, a very important thing to, to, to think about and to discuss. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Vice Minister. And that's a powerful um, mantra to keep in mind throughout today's conversation that no one will be safe until everyone is safe. And, and with that in mind, um, we do want to spend a few moments on thinking about what nations individually can be doing before we open to a broader conversation around regional strategies. So the first part of today's conversation will be more around designing national plans, and then we'll go into some of those multilateral agreements like COVAX, which with the Vice Minister brought up. Um, before we move to a really, what I think is going to be a fascinating conversation line around misinformation and uh, securing citizen trust in healthcare solutions, I want to start with just a general question for the group. What are the most probable pathways to national scale up and who are the key stakeholders influencing that policy? Um, do people feel there is adequate representation for some of the vulnerable populations that uh, the minister referenced? Um, do we think that there's a, enough emphasis around quality of treatment and prevention at an equitable, accessible level? Um, and in Latin America, what are some of the specific challenges that must be accounted for to make this happen in a rapid, rapid moment? Anybody want to kick us off? Um, shall I shall I start uh, just to get the ball rolling and to be helpful? It's always nice to be um, teacher's pet in that regard. Uh, I, um, I think it's been an extraordinary nine months, and what what in in terms of and an embarrassing nine months of the failure of the multilateral um, bodies around the the world to see this as the global problem that the, the minister so clearly articulated. Uh, I think uh, domestic constituencies, uh, particularly in, in Europe and I think in the US, uh, were driven very much by the domestic considerations of vaccine manufacture. And it became a rather unpleasant sort of national uh, competition uh, by countries to uh, have obtained their vaccine first and uh, inoculated their citizens first. And I think certainly in Africa, it's been very difficult to get a, a real international conversation going uh, that, that into which um, the, the developed countries can lead 
which has taken uh, the political le- uh, t- taken the political leadership on how do we how do we truly uh, develop a global plan that will that will, as the minister says, uh, secure our security and health uh, at the same time as securing the security and health of of the of the more disadvantaged. And I'm wondering, it's it's fabulous the work that Mexico and others have been doing in this regard. I know Cyril Ramaphosa in South Africa similarly doing so. But what expectation is there that this is going to be something that Western and developed countries can lead on? Because I think without that leadership, it becomes very difficult for these multilateral institutions, driven as they are by the front of the developing world, really to take to take ownership of this campaign. Uh, do we see the EU taking that position? Do we see uh, the Organization of American States? Uh, is there is there a, either multilateral or a or a country where we think is going to take global ownership of this issue and draw it away from the national concerns of their own political constituencies? I, I do think that's a great, yeah, Herman, please. I was just going to call because I had hoped that we would perhaps have the, the Colombian health ministry respond to that specific question. Yes, uh, you mentioned something that is very important and it's uh, creation of the formulation of the national plans. And this is, uh, those, these uh, nine months have been very interesting, as Richard just said, uh, very, uh, sometimes very chaotic. So these national plans uh, that uh, end in, in, in a multilateralism uh, have been very dynamic. So we, we did not have, obviously, a plan for, in this case, vaccination for COVID-19 in January, even in June. So we have to create, to formulate those plans by seeing, by watching the multilateralism, the multilateral scenario, but also the market scenario. And, and this is very dynamic. So it's been a very challenging uh, time for formulate a plan. And now, Herman, to- though, I was actually struck. It, it appears that um, Health Minister Ruiz has announced a vaccine strategy plan and, and back in August. So very quickly, in my opinion. Um, how did you make those decisions between June, as, as you say, you didn't have the information to August? What kind of um, data went into that design? More than data, we created some spaces of discussion, some institutionality around the, the, the formulation of the plan. So we created an advisory committee, we created two, actually two advisory committees with the experts uh, to, import, to better inform our policies and our plan to create our plan. So the, the point that I'm trying to make in here is that our plan is not static, it's a dynamic one. So the plan that we announced or the plan that you just uh, heard about on August is quite different of the plan of today. Actually, today, right now, we are uh, making some adjustments and probably some uh, uh, new, good news in the, in the next days that will change a little bit the plan. What we have clear, uh, like Mexico, we have clear the, the population, the target population uh, for the phase one of vaccination. We, we have that pretty clear. We have clear uh, what, what's the implementation of the vaccination will be, like the, the model around the uh, vaccination uh, program that we already have. Uh, but the uh, aspects of the, um, access uh, and the negotiations and uh, which vaccine will be first and which will be uh, in the second phase. Those are the things that the market are, are, are put in place every moment, every day. That's wonderful. If I might call on Dr. Laws, I'd love to hear if that's a, a similar kind of iterative um, approach that uh, St. Kitts and Nevis has adopted, or, or if you have anything else you want to contribute to kind of the design of your national plan. As okay, uh, so in, in St. Kitts and Nevis, okay, so our, our St. Kitts and Nevis national COVID-19 uh, preparedness and response plan similarly has been very dynamic, very fluid, and very iterative. Yes, 
And so we started working on our plan from as early as January of this year, and it has evolved. And so now we are at the stage whereby we are preparing for uh, the, the COVID-19 vaccines. So regarding the pathways to national scale uh, for small island states like ours, we really have to take a, a national all of society approach uh, as we prepare uh, for the deployment and implementation of COVID-19 uh, vaccines. It should be government led and as small island states, we have to collaborate with our regional partners like the Caribbean Public Health Agency, the Pan American Health Organization's regional office and further afield, the World Health Organization. So at present, uh, they are providing us with uh, many of the tools in terms of, of vaccine readiness tools and uh, guiding our, our plan as we prepare for deployment of, 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 of the virus, Vax, of the vaccine, sorry. Yeah, of course. Um, wonderful, yes, and those multilateral health institutions are so key to this. In, in thinking about the role they've played, Rashad, you've led uh, many of these global scale-up efforts through some of those multilateral health institutions. Can you speak a little bit about some of the learnings and it's, you've been training for this moment your entire career. What advice do you have for, for the region? Thank you, Hannah. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for convening this meeting and uh, it's, it's, it's really timely and uh, wonderful to be amongst colleagues uh, who are, have really put so much effort into this and are thinking uh, about it. Uh, I've already like taken a couple of notes and I want to build on what's been said. This is a global pandemic and yes, I agree, it requires a global plan. But the global plan is not one plan for the world. It is a coordinated global effort to rid us of the virus. And to do that, then we need to decentralize it to national plans and even within nations, we need to also have local plans and different countries will need different types of plans based on what they have on their context. So I do think that a coordinated global effort is called for and I, I do hope that uh, you know, the, 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 the world will step up to this. We do need that. Now, in looking at a plan like this, uh, I am, first of all, I, I have to uh, acknowledge the serious efforts that have gone into the uh, speedy development of a record-breaking development of a vaccine and all the investment that has been made in the mass production of vaccines. That is terrific. Today, I am hearing very serious efforts about the uh, rollout, the supply chain and the logistics involved in that. However, that's not the end of the story. There are two sort of, or three key parts that to me still stand out. And we can take those and decipher them as, as one by one. One of them is actually how do we rapidly scale up? The vaccines don't save lives. Vaccinating people, people that can save lives. So how do we rapidly scale up getting people vaccinated, particularly in the light of the fact that we do not know the duration of the immune response? That's going to be a critical thing. There's a science to scale up. And, and I hope that this is something we will pull on all the previous experiences we've had in this arena. The, the second area is that we're not really dealing with a rollout. We are dealing with a lot, and, and you've already mentioned the fact that people are like Her Excellency, Dr. Dugado, she said, it's not, the people are not asking, how do I get it? They're asking, why do I get it? And, and uh, if you have 10%, um, that's, that's to, you're in a lucky place. In other countries, it's more than a half of the people don't want to get it. So with, with that type of thing, we really do, do need to create the social movement that uh, elevates and the demand in such a way that we get a proper immune response. And the third thing that I still don't hear people talking about, although amongst some of my colleagues, we're already exploring it and we're starting to put our minds to it, which is, We've never, this is unprecedented in, in the way, you know, in this time and, and the given technology that we have. What is the learning system we're going to create as we embark on this? Because, you know, no plan withstands the test of time. As soon as we have a plan and we put it to action, we start to find out where that plan is failing. How are we going to learn from that in real time? How are we going to 
adjust and adaptively manage in order to succeed. And those are three big components that to me, I think we should be talking about. Yes, um, that was, that's fabulous. And I think the, the, the focus on national plans and as you say, the localism, the necessary local structures around this is absolutely the way forward. But you, you, you drew attention to the, you know, the 10% figure uh, of those in Mexico who have, who have um, you know, expressed an unwillingness to take a vaccine. In the UK, it's anything between 40 and 50%, um, which of course negates its effectiveness were that to be, were that to be uh, actually uh, uh, the, the, the state of mind of the population when the vaccines were rolled out. And I think we have a real problem here, and it's partly that the va it's the difficulty that governments have of a point of view on vaccines, the citizen, as me as an individual, my point of view and my view towards vaccines, being mixed up in a whole thing of other issues in terms of my view towards the government, my view towards uh, state effectiveness, my view towards big pharma, my view towards um, uh, medicine and industrialized medicine in that way. And you're finding, I think in the UK particularly, where we're doing quite a lot of work on this, a, you know, a communities of people who are rational in all other respects, but are, as we would view it, irrational in the way that they judge vaccines. And it's not because they can't understand the rational argumentation that the medics in their white coats give to the population. They sort of can, but they don't trust medics to give it, and they don't trust government officials to give it, and they don't trust the pharmaceutical industry to give it. So trying to find authoritative voices that are able to uh, uh, give assurance to the swathes of the population who are doubters of this is a really critical thing. And I think the other problem that we get here is, is that this is, a, for the first time ever, this is a vaccination campaign and a public health campaign that is being conducted almost entirely on social media. You can put as many posters as you like up in bus stations, but what is influencing people's thinking is the social media on this. And the, the engagement that I think governments, international communities are having with the major and largely US led and owned social media platforms is certainly a lot better than it was three or four years ago. Uh, and you are seeing initiatives emerging out of the social media platforms, which suggest they understand the critical role they play in shaping public sentiment perceptions on these issues. But my God, it's slow. And my worry is, is that they're concerned that, they're, that the complications that they quite often put and their, ineffective, their ineffectiveness at managing and controlling adverse and disinformation on their platforms is not, isn't allowing governments to really shape public perceptions of these issues. So if what we have is between 10 and 50% of our populations who don't want to sign up, and that, and that population who are gaining their information on medicine from the internet, the information on vaccines from, med from the internet, what are we able to do to shape with social media platforms the views and the perceptions of public of the public on these issues because i think unless we get that right we're going to end up with vaccines in clinics not being taken up by the population and if we don't manage that as you say a vaccine in a bottle is of no use it's a vaccine in a citizen that we need to try and get I just uh, jump in on that um if it's okay you know we're it, those are really excellent points um you know, I run a company uh, that that provides surety around the products and that we monitor the conditions of vaccines as they move through the supply chain and then we ensure those shipments against loss and so uh, you know our, our kind of vantage point on this um, really is like we look at this and see risk and and how do we mitigate risk um, and how do we use data to inspire confidence and trust um, and, you know, I think so much of this, uh, you know, we are getting our, our, our information now from, you know, from, from uh, social media, um, uh, from the news. It's interesting as someone who works in the cold chain space, like we think about cold chain supply chains is it is now, you know, it's on the, 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 the evening news, uh, it's front page news. Uh, all the ins and outs of vaccine. It's now a household phrase. You've it made so it. <laughs> I used to have to explain what cold chain was 
Um, and now, now, you know, it's the nuances of a cold chain and, um, you know, but I think that's, uh, that's, there's two sides of that, right? Consumers of those vaccines are going to be much more educated on what may happen between the manufacturer and them, uh, and all the risks of, of something kind of going out of temperature spec. Um, but, but it does make them more informed, uh, consumers. And, um, and I think it does demand, uh, another level of scrutiny that I think governments are going to have to live up to, to, to inspire trust. Um, and, you know, I think part of this, uh, I mean, a couple of thoughts in reaction to some of these comments, I think on the multilateral side, in particular in Latin America, we, um, my company Parcel, uh, is involved in an insurance initiative called the Global Health Risk Facility, which is actually launching next week with Lloyd's of London. So we have 15 different global insurers and reinsurers. They're going to be backing uh, insurance uh, for the distribution of these products. So, you know, working with these multilaterals, I just as a personal observation, I think it's, um, I feel like there is more aggressive multilateral leadership when it comes to the low and lower middle income countries. But when we get into middle income and upper middle income countries, which is a lot of Latin America, I'd sense that the multilats are just backing off a bit more and kind of leaving it up to, to individual countries. I'm curious reactions from the group who are more informed on that than I am. Um, but I think we lose some opportunity. And I think like even when we think about something like insurance, right, people don't really think about it, but we're able to, to aggregate demand across many countries and across this kind of unified commodity that we're distributing to deliver something that's really favorable um, to, to countries and the private sector that you couldn't otherwise do. And that takes multilats helping to aggregate all that demand. Um, and I think we lose some of that with the upper middle income countries, with middle income countries. Um, and I think, you know, the, the COVAX effort is obviously really, we, we, we or at least personally believe that's really important. Um, and, you know, I think certainly I, I see that Mexico has been very active um, in that. Uh, you know, I think the, the local private sector um, is going to be really important. A lot of the supply chains that we work with when it comes to vaccine distribution through, through Gavi and the WHO and the like are public, uh, public sector, uh, public supply chains um, run by ministries of health. And I think we're seeing that there's going to be some supplementary capacity needed from local, you know, cold storage companies and transit companies. Um, and we'll really need to leverage those new actors. That presents new risk. Those are people who aren't maybe used to working um, in those supply chains. Um, and, uh, it, you know, and then, and then there's just the, 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 um, the control needed to make sure that these products are safeguarded. And I think, you know, we have a lot of insights into supply chains, um, uh, less in Latin America, um, more in parts of, of Sub-Saharan Africa, but, you know, cold storage equipment, you know, vaccine refrigerators, cold rooms, those are, those are up, like a lot of them need upgrading, they need maintenance. Um, we need data to tell us, you know, where those improvements are needed. Um, and so I think we have a lot of, uh, I guess, theoretical kind of paper-based plans right now, including here in the U.S., about what we're supposedly going to do to distribute this. Um, and, I, and I think we're going to have to resource it, you know, accordingly. We're going to need to bring the same kind of inventiveness and investment and urgency to this task of distribution as we have to vaccine development. Um, and you know, the, the, the simple fact is vaccines don't work <laughs> if they get, you know, if they go out of compliance, they lose their potency. And, and it's just, it's one of these products that unfortunately requires near perfection in our ability to deliver them. Uh, and, and I just, we can't lose our sight on, you know, the practicalities of that, right? There's a sort of a tactical aspect of just logistics and getting the job done, moving products. Um, and, and that will probably more than anything, I help ins inspire confidence uh, when it comes to all these, these other issues. Um, so I'll stop there. I think seeing proof of concept will be um, very instrumental to building or, or growing some of the trust between health systems and the citizens as well. Mario, did you want to come in? Share with yes. us a little bit about it. <laughs> no, no, I think, I think, no, no, thank you. I think it's a very interesting debate. 
Hello to everybody. I want to put uh, clearly one point that is important for, you know, Latin America is more or less of the country in the region and middle income countries. It has a specific structural condition. And uh, I think there is two, two points. The first one is about multilateral, but the condition and the difficulty for multilateral system is because we don't, uh, we didn't uh, face the asymmetries that exist in the global economy and many issues. For example, intellectual property rights, you know. Intellectual property rights is becoming important and important. In this case, it really is an important thing. Uh, yeah. Because many countries in the region have the capability to produce this, but there is an enormous asymmetry in trade agreement, investment agreement, intellectual property agreement. And clear, there was no this capability of the multilateral system to to create facilities in these processes. Because countries, and I want to be very honest, and maintain, many of the countries maintain, uh, what they said is not what, the, what, uh, what, what they did, you know, what they are doing now. Because the country said, okay, we want to achieve each part of the world, but each country is playing its, 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 its uh, battles, you know, to have this, this call to have this part. It is very difficult because you have the political correct issue that the people say, no, we have to be very honest. We have to arrive at each part of the world, but each country when they arrive there and prob probably the elite of the country, they want to have their part, you know? And I want to put clearly, that this is something that is, I, for me is very worried about the multilateral system. I came from that organization because I can't stay in the UN organization. It does, can, we have to be very honest in this debate, you know, because uh, it's difficult. Second one, we think that this historical asymmetry in intellectual property, uh, trade and so on, we have to rethink everything about that because there is condition and sanitary condition and health condition, uh, you know, we can maintain these this asymmetries. So it's, it's crucial because we have countries like Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico that can produce, and the recent agreement between Argentina and Mexico show that. But on the other side, the risk country that can produce that and needs to be supported by the global community. And when you have this debate, all of the presidents around the world say, yes, yes, yes. But when you go, they want only, they, 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 they share, you know, that they quote it. That is, you know, we have to be very honest. You know, there is That's no, that is true. You have this, reflect this historical asymmetry. Second one, we have to be very correct on the debate. And the third one, that for me is important, is to achieve a, 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 the, this specific condition of a middle income country. For example, how you arrive to the informal people. You know what I mean informal people? People that work in activity that you can check that. People that income depend that they work every day that they are doing. Uh, informal activities, in many of the countries in the region don't achieve these people because these people is invisible people. It's not only to have the vaccine and, you know, to deliver with the vaccine, to maintain uh, everything to, to arrive to these people. It's to achieve these people, you know. It was difficult for countries to achieve them because they are in informal condition. Also, the welfare system can achieve them, you know. And I think Debate, and we have to be very honest in, on debate and not the political correct. To, to face this asymmetry, it to be very clear that there is a structural condition that is not only to have the vaccine and the vaccine is going to be useful and everything like that, is to achieve these people because it was difficult to achieve these people on the recent policy and action and social policy in this country. It was very difficult. It's very easy to achieve the people that live in Las Condes in Mexico and in, 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 in Santiago and you, there is part of the city, network of the, of the city, that you can achieve them, you know, be careful. And where you have the infection that is developed very high. You know? uh, this is a, the real debate, you know, for me. And it's important, your debate and what you say about multilateral, because we have to be very, very honest on that. Thank you. No, I think that's great, Mario. Now is not the time to be um, speaking in epitaphs, but to, we have to be practical and real and authentic with the information we're giving if we're going to move forward collectively. I think um, you bring up a very great point about that asymmetry between countries and even communities within countries and their ability to uh, withstand or address um, and, and respond to uh, this disease. And so we do have a question from the audience that I'd like to put out for um, a panelist to, to respond to. And it's around the projected costs of vaccines and whether 
anyone feels it's likely or, or feasible in, in keeping with Mario's point that we're not just saying nice talking points, but we're being real. Do we think it's likely that a vaccine would be seen as a public good, as a global public good, or kind of what are the financing mechanisms that will be essential to address this? And I want to thank our audience member for, for putting that question in and encourage others to continue using that feature so that we can make sure we're addressing them throughout the conversation. So does anybody want to talk about the realities of actually dollars to, to, to development and whether this is likely to be seen as a global public good? Carmela, on the spot. Um, of course, Colombia has some con confidentiality agreements, so we cannot speak openly about costs of vaccines in this point, but I want to make some points about it and about multilateralism. I think the COVAX uh, facility and the COVAX uh, strategy it's trying to approach to a multilateral way to face this issue about the costs. Uh, obviously, COVAX tried to get access in an equitable way for all the countries that are part of COVAX. And this is probably the first time that this amount of, this amount of countries has gathered together to at least try to get more uh, Peer negotiations and, call and, and, and have to, uh, you know, a collective effort to get a, a peer negotiation with the uh, pharmaceutical industry. The other aspect I want to mention is that um, I think the econometric models about this, the economic models, like for example, the Kramer model, have shown that the benefits of the vaccination are much higher than the, than the costs. So that's that's the data that we have used in our discussions. And uh, we have perfect, we, we have uh, uh, modeled the, 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 the benefits that the vaccine will have in the, not only the, in the economy, but of course in the life of the people. And that's the kind of data that we have used to make the decisions. That's the, those are the two points I want to, to point from here. Vice Minister, please. Well, I think that uh, it's very interesting analyzing how vaccines can be a public good, uh, but they are not going to be free. So the countries need to buy this product, which indeed needs a lot of funding to be developed in the world. Every laboratory has spent millions and billions of dollars. Uh, developing the, the research and development needed for, for getting a, uh, and the speed up the process to get a, a vaccine authorized, authorized a vaccine to, for COVID-19. So for example, in Mexico, the president has uh, committed to make a universal vaccination for all and for free, but the country is gonna spend uh, quite amount of money to buy these vaccines. It is uh, interesting, uh, as uh, my colleague minister in, in, um, uh, in Colombia said, COVAX is one way to balance the cost of the vaccines because if low income countries are gonna pay for the same vaccine less than the, than the uh, developed countries. But we, are, we have to recognize that, for example, the strategy of the European Union is to buy a lot, a lot, a lot of, uh, of, of vaccines. And after they complete their process of vaccination of their country, they're going to be also um, allowed and uh, keen to distribute even for free vaccines for other countries. This has to do also with the um, character of, uh, of the, uh, the research and development processes. Uh, it's very important for us to recognize that the, the states, the, the different nations need to support and strengthen their local abilities to produce vaccines. In Mexico, we have four different projects to produce vaccines. We have not resigned to the uh, opportunity or possibility to have our own vaccine for the Mexicans. We recognize that maybe in the first year we are gonna buy 
vaccines for the other countries and companies. But uh, after uh, a couple of years, we, we really need to be self-sufficient of this product. We do not know how long it's gonna take the um, immunization. This is also a, uh, uh, the, the trials of the phase three of uh, clinical essays of all the vaccines will demonstrate how long it, uh, the vaccines will, uh, will make uh, this immunization for people. And uh, uh, we now recognize that supporting our own uh, scientific bodies to uh, develop vaccines is very important for the near future. We have to recognize also that this is a very, very broad and uh, pernicious pandemic but it is not a, be the only one. Um, the climate change and the situation of the loss of biodiversity is uh, promoting the generation of more viruses. And uh, is the, 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 this experience uh, will show us a lot of um, lessons to be learned in order to strengthen the multilateral institutions, of course, to be ready to cooperate. I have to to say also that Mexico is leading the CELAC, which is the community of Latin America and the Caribbean states. And it's, it's not easy for all nation for the access, distribution, and uh, making contracts for vaccines. It's, it is very, very hard to convince the countries to work together and joint efforts in the same way. And this is also what we have to uh, talk about and to and to learn about this process. Vice Minister, thank you so much. That's a perfect segue. I want to use the second half of today's conversation before a closing question for everybody and um, to really talk about that coordination at the regional level. Um, and if I might ask you to dig and, and present a little bit more, Minister, what are the sticking points? Why are countries, what are things that they're routinely saying that are perhaps limits to um, that coordination that you're wanting to see at the multilateral level? Is there a consistent theme or kind of a, an ongoing uh, nationalism challenge set that's, that's a barrier here? And that can be to the vice minister or to whomever, um, but really kind of what are some of the barriers to the coordination that exists right now? knowing that, of course, the region is made up of a diverse set of states? Well, we do have uh, technical approaches, barriers. Uh, indeed, there, there are several sectors of the health uh, community that are not keen to make a, a emergency, authorization, emergency authorization of vaccines. And the, it is a uh, as someone uh, referred in, in this panel, it is an unprecedented circumstances where what we are facing. So there is a debate on if it is uh, really proper to approve, to make this uh, emergency approval of vaccines. We have uh, also political barriers, for example, in this experience that I am talking about in CELAC, uh, we have different political difference among the group different kind of governments that are not willing to cooperate among them sometimes in, in the specific uh, matters. And these, uh, we have also economic barriers. There are countries that cannot afford the cost of uh, a, an early access of vaccines right now. We have to also recognize that vaccines are gonna be able uh, and uh, available for, for the world in a couple of years, broad and cheap. But right now, what we are fighting for is for the a early access for a vaccine. For example, in Mexico, we are uh, going to maybe receive the first stock of uh, Pfizer's doses uh, in, in uh, December here, this, this very month. But uh, other companies are offering the delivery in March, in April, in June, July. So uh, extended in the time. At, at, at the most uh, long period of time waiting, it's gonna be uh, more, more hard, harder to, for the countries to recover economically speaking, also socially, this become, the social control is gonna be more difficult to, to obtain. So right now the urgency of uh, all is uh, making the vaccines to, to be expensive indeed. 
of course, it's not just about the investment in the vaccines themselves, but it's also the infrastructure by which to distribute and disseminate. Noting, as, as one um, audience member points out, um, Luca, that there's different geographies, different populations, um, different uh, practical barriers to access that exist in this space. Um, and we've spoken a little bit about that on today's session, but I'd love to give that a little bit more time because it seems really important um, that like once you have all your beautiful vaccines in country, how do you get them out there at the speed, at the rate that is necessary? Um, and I'd open that to, up to everybody, but at some point, I definitely want Ben to be responding to this question. Okay, in term, can, I, can I come in? All right, so in terms of the Caribbean member states uh, access, the economic barrier of access to, to purchase in the vaccine uh, has been somewhat over, uh, overcome by the COVAX facility. So almost all Caribbean member states have signed on to the COVAX facility because it's seen as the safest bet to ensure the sustained provision of vaccines to the Caribbean region. And uh, the Caribbean Public Health Agency brokered a very good collaboration between CAFA, the European Union, and PAHO, and uh, th this secured the down payment of over US $2 million to Gavi uh, for nine CAFA member states. And uh, four other member states were able to make their own uh, down payment. And so, so this was good in terms of the uh, Caribbean member states now having access, economic uh, access to to, to, to vaccines. In terms of uh, the distribution of the vaccines, uh, that's going to be a problem in terms of maintaining the cold chain because some of the vaccines have to be, uh, you know, stored at negative 70 degrees. And so as small island states, we are going to have to forge strong partnerships uh, between the private sector who would have the, the, the means of helping us to store the vaccines at at this level. And so in order for us to be able to have an effective vaccine delivery strategy, we are going to have to forge strong partnerships, public and private sector. In terms of uh, misinformation to access, again, the Caribbean Public Health Agency has been proactive in developing a survey, uh, the aim of which is to determine the reasons for vaccine hesitancy. And so this information is going to dictate our, our our uh, comprehensive education campaign so that you can foster trust in the science and, uh, and as Rashad would say, uh, create that social movement so you can have adequate amount of persons accepting, accepting the vaccine. In terms of the regulatory preparedness, that's gonna be an issue within the Caribbean uh, region, but again, the Caribbean Public Health Agency is well poised to help us because uh, a monitoring uh, uh, arm, a Caribbean regulatory system that can work alongside member states in order for us to be ready in terms of the, the legal regulatory framework. So that just gives you an idea as to what's happening in our region. Thank you so much. And it sounds like it's truly being approached as a regional block. Um, with, with most uh, Caribbean island nations aligned in, in some of their strategy pieces. Ben, did you have anything you wanted to add here from some of your experiences in the um, storage and distribution side of things? Yeah, sure. And I'll try to, there's some other questions, I think, in a similar vein um, that are coming in. Uh, a few thoughts. I mean, I think the first, first here is really, um, there, there's, there have been a number of vaccine breakthroughs um, with Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, I think there are going to be more on the way. Um, I think as we look at some of these uh, these vaccine candidates coming forward, and I think there's now 50 in you know, different phases, uh, later phases, there are going to be some options. And, and one decision is what, what type of vaccine is most appropriate to distribute given the strength of the infrastructure. Um, my personal opinion is that ultra cold chain is not gonna be appropriate for many countries um, or may just play a role in terms of getting that first wave of essential healthcare workers uh, uh, vaccinated. But that is a very challenging product to distribute even in, here in the US. I think we're gonna really struggle with it outside of urban areas. Um, 
you know, so, so what's, the, what's the right vaccine to match the country? You know, this, this AstraZeneca vaccine that they're making with Serum Institute and you know, Gates Foundation and Gavi have been involved with, you know, they've really been able to drive down the price. I think there was another question around price. Um, and so that can, that can drive availability. Um, but that's a, that vaccine, just to use as an example, will be a, a, two, a traditional kind of cold chain vaccine would be keep it between two and eight degrees Celsius. Um, and that's just gonna be much easier to distribute because you can use existing refrigeration technology. Essentially, you need to keep it, you know, to the temperature that you keep your, your food in your refrigerator. Um, and, uh, and that even, I should say, is a challenge, right? Um, uh, we see, see plenty of challenges with that product alone. Once you introduce a freeze, a, a freeze uh, level vaccine or even an ultra freeze, the challenges just compound. Um, we have seen, you know, as we think about where, where are the challenges in the supply chain, there's kind of three big ones. Um, one is obviously the cold chain. Uh, uh, theft is going to be a, another risk. Um, and then fire. And so as you, as you bring vaccines in, you store them in certain locations, these will be moving pretty quick. Those are the things that will cause vaccines to, to get lost or spoil. Um, you know, cold chain, I think, is the, is the most acute. Um, and as I was saying earlier, you know, you, you really can't afford uh, much margin of error. Um, some of the insights, so we monitor vaccine supply chains and actually we monitored several national level uh, vaccine supply chains in the cold chain. So looking at national medical stores all the way down to uh, health posts and even uh, village distribution with healthcare workers using the, the cold box um, to, to hold the vaccine. So we have a pretty good sense of what those risks look like. And I think you know, the, the, certainly the risk is highest to vaccines in the, what we would call the last mile. So basically district level down in a country um, pushing those vaccines out. Uh, one interesting insight we have, um, you know, from from a, a national level supply chain, we, we've studied half of the vaccine damage in that country is coming from just five percent of the refrigerators. So um, we can target those refrigerators. They're old. They're faulty. They need some upgrades, and dramatically lower the risk to those vaccines in the supply chain. Obviously, we need the data to do that. You know, we, we put these little low cost sensors in to, to collect that data and, and provide those insights. Um, we found that, um, you know, a lot of people think cold chain, so the biggest risk to those vaccines must be that they get too hot, right? It's actually the opposite. When you're talking about a two to eight degree vaccine, um, uh, our data tells us, and ac academic studies have confirmed, actually the greatest risk to those vaccines is them freezing. They're much less tolerant to freezing temperatures than they are to heat events. Um, so, uh, and, and so what happens when you're distributing them is you're putting them in these cold boxes, ice-lined ice cold boxes, they freeze the vaccines, or a faulty refrigerator will freeze the vaccines. And we found that moving vaccines through that last mile from the district down, um, if we can reduce the time that they spend in the last mile by half, just from a time elapsed standpoint, we can reduce the amount of vaccine loss by 40%. So there's, there's definitely something to speed. Uh, there's something to using data to find the weak points in the supply chain. Uh, and those can be addressed quickly. And I think that's as we, as we begin these rollouts, as we begin taking these kind of paper tabletop exercises, we need to be collecting a lot of real-time data because we can mm -hmm. adjust really quickly um, as, as we do this. So. It sounds like for this to be truly successful, a lot of those minute, precise decisions um, driven by data, um, and that's what's going to be called for. Very, you know, um, little adjustments will make a big, big difference. It sounds like from your from your assessment. Um, in thinking about precise and data and and what's necessary, I do want to hear from various panelists, what success in 2021 looks like. So if we say year one starts in January, maybe it's, maybe it's this year as early for, for Mexico that's starting to, to receive hopefully this month some vaccines, but in year one, what does success look like? And, and more specifically, what percentage of the population vaccinated in, in your experiences and models is the minimum acceptable level um, for not only national health, but also um, an economic recovery? Come on. Yeah, I know so, you've done this. 
Uh, I know what it is for Colombia. I've seen it. Okay, I, I will not uh, compromise a number, but definitely we need to va to vaccine first the the, the higher risk population. Uh, those are in general uh, the, the 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 older people, um, the people with uh, comorbidities, and of course our health workers. In general, there are other populations that have other risks, uh, and we may have a special consideration for people with social economic uh, vulnerabilities, of course. And I want very quick to uh, make um, a point about the, the, the last question, and is that the success of that logistic challenges uh, will depend on how close, on how closely can we be, be able to work with the producers. Uh, to determine the logistic, uh, and to approach those logistic challenges, to have the vaccine in the vaccination point, for example. That, that will be key and that will be uh, very important. Also the real-time data. And uh, to uh, go back, to come back to the question, um, the success will be maybe around 20% of the populations, as Kovacs just said. But the, besides the number, the most important is the groups of the population that we are going to vaccine first. I agree Mark. with that in terms of uh, being able to, to immunize, uh, vaccinate the vulnerable in our population, those who are chronically ill, those who are elderly, those in long-term care facilities, uh, and our healthcare workers, our frontline workers. So I won't hazard a guess in terms of the percentage because um, that's an interesting question. What percentage of the population vaccinated is the minimum acceptable level? But another Very question- Very Machiavellian. Yeah, but another interesting question is, uh, do we really know the level of herd immunity threshold that will be required to prevent the spread of COVID-19? Okay, that's another very interesting question. Vice Minister? I think that uh, even though uh, the vaccine would, would deliver good results and in a very, very uh, good way and very fast because we have to recognize that the development of COVID-19 vaccines has been the most uh, rapid developed develop vaccine in the world in history. We need to also take into account that it is not the, the only one strategy available to fight against the pandemic. For example, other countries as China, they are using other strategies. Indeed, they are not relying on vaccines, even they have a lot of uh, research and development of some very good uh, uh, alternatives. They are, uh, they, their entire system is uh, relayed on uh, the uh, tests and uh, traceability, and they are controlling the contagiousness of this illness by a very, very, um, by, by the, uh, these systems of, of testing and tracking people, which is a uh, who, who are uh, infected, and complementarily with vaccines. Also, we have not to for, to forgive to uh, to forgive the uh, to forgive to forget the uh, the treatments. There are a lot of pharmaceutical treatments right now, also in phase one, two, and three, to uh, to down to 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 for for people to get better for people not to get uh, really um, in hospitals while they are uh, convalescent of COVID-19 at home, for example. There are a lot of treatments right now uh, in the next year. I think that uh, maybe in medicine, a very good one would be available for, for the world. And uh, it would be also a very important way to down uh, uh, the, these, uh, well, these, very, very hard times that we're living right now. Agreed, wonderful. I think it's, it's that multitude of strategies that's important. Uh, Concordia hosted a very interesting conversation with SAS at our annual summit in September around contract tracing. Um, so it's worth checking that out as well. Um, I definitely wanna turn over to Rashad for a moment. Um, I know he's got some points to contribute to this conversation before going into the final question. Rashad? Thank you. Um, on the last point about 
what percentage of the population, etc. I mean, again, I'll reiterate, we don't know how the duration of the immune response. Um, and the R0 is somewhere between two and three for uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So um, from uh, just what I understand from that is that we would need to immunize somewhere between 60 to 70 percent of the population of the planet and every country and every community in order to actually reach the herd immunity. Somewhere along those lines, I'm not an epidemiologist as such, so, and there are people who can attest to this better, but my understanding from them is that this is where we need to be. And that brings me to the three buckets I was talking about. The first bucket is the rapid scale up. So, and I, I you know, I wanna emphasize the importance of everything right down to the supply chain that brings the vaccine in good working condition to the uh, place where it's going to be uh, used. However, the scale-up strategy itself is a critical one. Where do we actually distribute? How do we reach every community? The, 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 the logistics of getting a rapid scale-up strategy in place are quite, can be quite mind-boggling. And there are some principles related to that, but we do have to get it right in order to be able to vaccinate the right people in the right places with the right numbers, et cetera, and to, to get it right. The second piece, which I think we all can play a role in, and, and it's something I want to urge us to do it, the success is not just dependent on having the vaccines. It's also dependent on people accepting to get vaccinated. And this whole notion of can we create the campaign, the, the movement for, uh, so, uh, you know, for, for, for social marketing of, of the vaccine to increase uh, the rate of adoption? We are living in the age of misinformation. It's a fact. I mean, uh, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, uh, not to think that way. And with this fact, I do think it's a critical component of the success of, of, you know, of, this, uh, uh, of getting over this pandemic is really uh, creating that. And we do need to create that social movement, what it takes and what, it, what that uh, uh, would look like is yet to be figured out, but we need to be able to reach people where they are and convert people's thinking so that the rate of acceptance to get vaccinated is increased. So those are really critical things. And, I, I, and along with that, I also don't want to um, sort of forget the fact that we, uh, you know, the contact tracing and, and isolation and all the preventive public health measures need to be put in place. But also, as, as we are moving in this direction, we do need to emphasize the fact that we still need to exercise all the precautions, the, uh, the physical distancing, the, the, the masks, et cetera, that we are doing now, because this will take months uh, uh, until it comes up. The last thing I would like to see is, you know, by the time the governments have sort of taken care of the priority groups and now it's made available everywhere, people are just not coming to get the vaccine because we haven't done the prep work needed to increase the demand for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm glad you said I, I will certainly close this panel again with the same urgency, but you know, we're not out of the woods yet. And um, the uh, recommended guidelines to prevent this further spread of this are essential for people to be um, adopting at the moment. So we have a few moments left and I'd like to close today's conversation with a bit of a focus of the, the so what's the, the next steps. Um, this being Concordia and our mission being to promote public private partnerships and support cross-sector collaboration. Uh, I would love to hear from every single individual on this panel um, what their dream public private partnership or just cross-sector partnership would be um, if they could start one tomorrow? What do you think is necessary? What do you think is missing? Um, and in 45 seconds or less, I'd love to hear that. Um, the aim here is, of course, for the Concordia Action Alliance, which we created earlier this year to support um, the, the development and design of partnerships and that we could take some of these ideas that are laid forth today and put those into action so that when we are able to gather together in person in the future, um, some of these have been done. So um, I would love to start. I will start with mine. Um, and it actually dovetails to one of the questions from an audience member, and it's about information sharing. Um, and this is around, Ben mentioned, maybe 50 different vaccines. I would love to see collaboration for transparent information sharing, where we have a comparison of the different vaccine options out there so that citizens can make informed decisions for the best vaccine for them based on accessibility, affordability, applicability, and ultimately safety. 
Um, but I just don't know if that information is out there bundled in a beautiful website that everybody around the world can reach. Um, so that's mine. <laughs> um, but I'd like to go around the circle if anybody else wants to kick us off. Well, I just add mine because it's rather a version of yours, which is, oh, which weird. is, yes, Nick that here. information exists. Yes, yes, rational, uh, informed uh, information for, for citizens on, on, on why a vaccine is good for them exists. Uh, but getting that into, uh, into the understanding of citizens requires, uh, both on, on social media and otherwise, a public uh, health campaigning methodologies that some countries are better at than others. And there's a there's, a, there's certainly a private public sector alliance to be built around. How does one do that bit well? Uh, how can one exchange best practice in, in public health campaigning so that uh, we can utilize all the techniques that are emerging so fast around social media to do this well, and that we're, we're co cooperating and bringing in the expertise from, from all markets into doing this well. And I, I know no of, no of no multilateral institution that could bring that thing together. But those, that alliance, I think, would be an enormously powerful one if one could create it. Thank you, Richard. I want to make a comment uh, from, from, from make like I think uh, I want first of all I want to say to Marta Delgado uh, uh, clearly from make let's send the regards for Marisa Barcena this is <laughs> I want to do that sorry but uh, what you said Marta about the importance coordination in CELAC that is a crucial point because you have to achieve it different countries in the region I know all of the countries have the same possibility and capabilities. I think that this coordination from Mexico is a crucial one to put in the center for the regional. The second one, public and private alliance is becoming crucial because it's not only that the people accept or not the vaccines, it's the problem is to give the opportunities and equal opportunities that everybody can uh, achieve the vaccine and has to be applied. That's this crucial one. In that sense, it's not the state only but itself can, can achieve it. The, the public alliance in the maintaining the, the cold chain and everything is crucial. When I think uh, all of the countries, all of the government has to begin with this process and to create a protocol clearly with the private sector. This is a crucial one. Great, thank you. Um, Anybody else want to hop in with their dream PPP? Well, I will uh, okay. just, uh, I guess, from the private sector perspective, um, you know, and uh, not to sound too parochial, but but we, you know, we uh, really want to do what we can uh, to lower the risk to these products. So we've put together an alliance uh, of 15 different insurance companies backing these very high risk distributions. It is very difficult to work with um, dozens and dozens of, of sovereign government counterparties. And so what I'd like to see, um, similar to what we're working on with some of the multilaterals in Geneva, but on a regional basis in Latin America, is a way to uh, work uh, on a multilateral level to make sure that we can offer the kind of coverage across the region to protect these products and to monitor those supply chains. And we've really put together the private sector part of that, uh, but we do need a kind of public sector interlocutor to, to do that at scale. Well, it's possible we'll have to make sure you're part of the CELIC conversations with the minister moving forward then. Um, Herman, you have a hand raised? Yeah, thank you. My dream is to have a joint roadmap, not only for, have, for having uh, equal access, but also to prepare for the next pandemic. And that uh, is uh, it's a plan that we need to have as a multilateral community uh, based on the lessons we have learned, but also on the debates that we already uh, have issued and on the debates that we have right now, for example, the debates about the public goods or other, other, other difficult debates. But we definitely need to put those debates and those lessons that we have learned into a really well, a, a pragmatic and a roadmap uh, in preparation for next pandemics that for sure we will have. Great. Rashad? Sure. Uh, I would love to see a serious partnerships uh, to support and to message clearly the truth in this arena. Wonderful. Vice Minister? Uh, I, I think that uh, 
I dream about the possibility in Latin America and the Caribbean to organize consolidated purchases for vaccines and other medicines in the region. We can really uh, organize these purchases together in order to uh, access better prices and conditions for the region, including the uh, uh, possibility of uh, the insurances. For example, we can also put uh, together some countries to have the insurances and, uh, and reinsurance for, for distribution of the vaccines and also other medicines. It would be great. We have tried to do that uh, through the CELAC, the community of Latin America and the Caribbean states. We haven't started yet uh, to do it, but it would be very, very important for, for all the countries of the region. Wonderful. Dr. Laz. Yes, uh, so my dream is one in which we uh, could enhance the campaign, utilizing all the, the, the media platforms, especially social media, uh, to reach our population more effectively. Uh, for now, uh, to, 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 to reduce uh, COVID-19 fatigue, and then going forward in terms of bringing more persons on board to accept the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Masterful. I want to thank everybody for spending their time and sharing their ideas, their challenges, and their hopes and aspirations um, with this group and with our audience at the Concordia America Summit. I, I know we've all learned a lot, um, and I'm hopeful that this body and our different entities that we each represent can come together to build on some of these ideas and to more meaningfully, collaboratively, and together move forward. Because as, as this panel has reinforced, until we all have the vaccine, um, it's, it's not going to, to be addressed. And so um, it's truly a global effort as we've never seen before. Thank you so much to everybody for joining. I encourage everyone who's in the audience to head on back to the, um, the program and uh, let's keep these great conversations going. If you have ideas and suggestions based on the passions and the insights that our panelists shared, please be sure to use the connect features along the side of the Spot Me platform for our all access pass holders. Start those conversations. Let's keep momentum going and let's get this done. Have a wonderful day. Wash your hands, wear a mask, stay well. Bye-bye.